Kann ich loslegen? Hello and, Hello and a very hearty welcome to our fifth round of the discussion series What's Left? We from the Foundation Friedrich Ebert Stiftung and the Working Group Philosophy of the Social Democrats are happy to see you maybe back again here, either at home with your screens or here, a few people in the room anyway, welcome. People who have been following our series know what it is about, What's Left? is to try to look beyond daily, day-to-day -day politics and uh, to search for ideas and uh, progressive ideas for tomorrow's society. The event today is a very special event uh, for certain reasons and we also have very special guests because for once we will look back to an event uh, which lies back 50 years but uh, still shapes the way we talk about justice. In 1971, the philosopher John Rawls uh, published his work, A Theory of Justice. And uh, with this, he began the debate of what justice is, is, how it can be designed. He revived it, and he also massively shaped it. We can see that today as well. Uh, we see that in political philosophy and practice, uh, and we see it, uh, this is seen that way with his proponents and his critics. And uh, this anniversary uh, nowadays uh, falls, comes at a time where Germany sets the course uh, completely in a new way and uh, in the new uh, legislative period. And the question is, what is justice and what do we want the, a just society to be like and how do we get there? And uh, of course, we will certainly hear many answers and ideas today because we have the great honor to have some of the leading thinkers and doers in terms of justice with us today. And uh, we will uh, uh, be very intrigued to see what the ideas are. Now, we will have this evening, it'll be in two parts. Uh, we will have a philosophical highlight right at the beginning. Professor Michael Sandel from Harvard University and Professor Susan Neyman, director of the Einstein Forum in Potsdam, will talk about what uh, 50 years after Rawls' theory uh, uh, just uh, society looks like. And uh, then we will have Professor Karl Lauterbach. He is a member of the German Parliament. He is the health expert of the SPD parliamentary group. And he will give us a political idea of this debate. And then we have uh, Matthias Pfeffer, who's going to lead us through the discussions. He was a journalist for 30 years. He's an author now, and he writes about philosophical criticism and political regulation of artificial intelligence. In the second discussion round, we then want to talk about current uh, questions of justice and also look at concrete steps towards that. We will have Susan Neyman and Karl Lauterbach, but also the Chief Advisor of the EU Commission, Paul Nemitz, and Ruth Kron from Konzeptwerk Neue Ökonomie. So use the chat. Uh, we will also pick up your questions and we will try to talk about some of them. And uh, as usual, we will also take a picture of our discussion uh, or rather, we will have somebody paint a picture, and we have uh, Mrs. Gadriel Schlips here doing it, and uh, we'll be very in interested in seeing it at the end. And now, at last, we want to begin, and we will begin with our keynote speaker, who we are particularly looking forward to. So I would like to welcome Professor Michael Sandel, Sandel, whom I hope to see on screen now in a minute. Beautiful. Here he is. Welcome, Professor Sandal. Professor Sandal teaches political philosophy at Harvard University, where he gave his uh, famous uh, justice lectures seen by millions online. And uh, Michael Sandal researches on questions of justice, ethics, democracy, and markets, and his work is discussed everywhere in the world. His uh, book, The Tyranny of Merit, where he criticizes the negative aspects of, the mer of meritocracy, 
was uh, discussed uh, very much also here in Germany and especially with the Social Democrats. Professor Sandel, we are very much looking forward to hearing what uh, a just society is to you and uh, how you, what you think about John Rawls' heritage. Justice, solidarity and the common good, those are the things you're talking about. The floor is yours. Vielen Dank und eine spannende Veranstaltung. Thank you and enjoy. You know, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, it's a special honor to be in conversation with Professor Neyman, an old friend, and with Professor Lauterbach. Let's begin with John Rawls and his contribution to the left, to liberal or to social democratic politics. In many ways, the legacy of Rawls is very important, defining center-left politics over the last few decades in two respects. First, he offered a philosophical critique of utilitarianism as a political philosophy and argued instead for the importance, the fundamental importance of individual rights and human dignity. Second, he made a powerful case for the welfare state and for redistribution. And the grounds of that case, of that argument was that those whose talents reap enormous material benefits in a market economy can't be said to deserve the full measure of the benefits that the market bestows upon them because having those talents and having those talents valued at this or that moment is not their doing. It's a measure of their good fortune. And therefore, we should regard the distribution of natural talents and assets as a common good and to benefit from them only on terms that work to the advantage of the least well off. These two ideas, the importance of rights and human dignity and the argument against either a libertarian or a market or a market meritocratic idea of distributive justice is a powerful and important enduring legacy of John Rawls. Now, I was a critic of Rawls. The grounds on which I criticized him had not to do with these first claims, but instead to do with a deeper aspect of his philosophical argument. His argument, drawing on the tradition of Immanuel Kant, that said the right is prior to the good. The principles of justice that specify our rights don't depend on any particular conception of the human good or of human flourishing. I think that claim was a mistake, a mistake philosophically, but also the source of a weakness politically for the center left and for social democratic politics. And I'll try to explain why. And I'll try to argue that what the left needs today is to depart from that aspect of the Rawlsian Kantian philosophical project that insists that we must keep conceptions of the good life out of politics and public discourse and constitutional argument. I say we should bring conceptions of the good back in. Here's why I think so. And it takes me to the kind of merit, market meritoc meritocratic society that has unfolded in the decades since John Rawls wrote. Let's begin with the current political moment. For decades, the divide between winners and losers has been deepening, poisoning our politics, pulling us apart. This has partly to do with the widening inequalities of income and wealth that we've seen in recent decades. But it's not only that. It has also to do with changing attitudes towards success that have accompanied the widening inequalities. Those who have landed on top have come to believe that their success is their own doing, the measure of their merit, 
and that they therefore deserve the bounty that a market society heaps upon the successful. This way of thinking about success arises from a seemingly attractive ideal, the principle of meritocracy, the principle that says if chances are equal, the winners deserve their winnings. There are two problems with this idea of meritocracy. The first, the most familiar, is that chances are not truly equal. We all know this. Those who are born to poor families tend to stay poor as adults. Access to colleges and universities, to higher education, reflect advantages of income and wealth and upbringing. But the problem is not only that we fail to live up to the meritocratic ideals we profess. The ideal itself is flawed. It's flawed because meritocracy, even a perfect meritocracy, is corrosive of the common good. This is the dark side of meritocracy. It leads to hubris among the winners and humiliation for those who are left behind. It encourages the successful to forget the luck and good fortune that helped them on their way. And it leads them to prize and valorize the kinds of credentials that enable them to get ahead. And it leads them to look down on those less credentialed, less fortunate than themselves. This brings us to contemporary politics. One of the most potent sources of the populist backlash against elites is the sense among many working people that elites look down on them. This is a legitimate complaint because even as globalization brought deepening inequality and stagnant wages, its proponents offered workers some bracing advice. If you want to compete and win in the global economy, they said, go to university. What you earn will depend on what you learn. You can make it if you try. These meritocratic elites, these credential elites, failed to see the insult implicit in this advice. If you didn't go to university, and if you're not flourishing in the new economy, your failure must be your fault. This is the implication. So it's no wonder that many working people turned against meritocratic elites, and at the same time turned against social democratic or progressive or center left parties who have, after all, been the primary targets of the populist backlash against elites. This is because by 2016, center-left parties had become, in their outlook and their interests and in their policies and in their values, more attuned to the well-credentialed, well-educated professional classes than to the working class voters who once constituted their base. We saw this in the vote for Brexit in Britain. We saw this in the election of Trump in the United States. We saw this in the abandonment by many working class voters of social democratic parties in Germany and in France and in other parts of Europe. So what should we do? We need to rethink the meritocratic political project. Most of us, those of us who spend our days in the company of the credential can easily forget a simple fact. Most of our fellow citizens don't have a university degree. Nearly two thirds of Americans don't. And the figures are similar in Germany and most European countries. So it's folly, it's a mistake to create an economy that makes a university diploma a necessary condition 
for dignified work and a decent life. We should focus less, and by we I mean social democratic parties, should focus less on arming people for meritocratic competition and focus more on making life better for those who may lack a diploma, but who make essential contributions to our society through the work they do, the families they raise, and the communities they serve. This means shifting the political message and focus and frame from arming people for a meritocratic race toward renewing the dignity of work. We should put the dignity of work at the center of our politics. And not only for reasons of distributive, redistributive justice, also for the sake of what I would call contributive justice. We need to remember that work is not only about making a living. It's also about contributing to the common good and winning recognition for doing so. It's tempting to assume, and we easily slide into this assumption, that the money people make is the measure of their contribution to the common good. But this is a mistake. If we simply accepted the market's verdict on who contributes the greatest value to society, we would have to accept that what a hedge fund manager does, what a banker does, is worth 700 times or 800 times as much as what a school teacher does, or a nurse, or a doctor. But even the most ardent defenders of free markets are unlikely to make this claim. Martin Luther King, shortly before his assassination, spoke to a group of striking sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee. And here's what he said. He said, the person who picks up our garbage is in the final analysis as significant as the physician. Because if he doesn't do his job, disease is rampant. All labor has dignity. Today's pandemic makes this clear. We've learned how deeply we depend on workers we often overlook. Not only those workers in the hospital doing heroic work. I'm thinking also of delivery workers workers, warehouse workers, grocery store clerks, nurse assistants, childcare workers. These are not the best paid or most honored workers in our societies. And yet during the pandemic, we began to describe them as essential workers, as key workers. So this could be a moment for a broader public debate about how to bring their pay and recognition into better alignment with the importance of the work they do. What passes for public discourse these days consists too often of either narrow managerial technocratic talk, which inspires no one, or shouting matches, where partisans and ideologues shout past one another without really listening. I think most citizens in democratic societies find this deeply frustrating. Not only is this way of conceiving public discourse hollow out democratic life, the reign of technocratic merit has reconfigured the terms of social recognition in ways that elevate the prestige of credentialed professional classes and that depreciate the contributions of most workers eroding their social standing. It is this aspect of technocratic merit or market-defined merit that contributes most directly, it seems to me, to the angry, polarized politics of our time. 
Mainstream parties and elites have missed this dimension of politics. They have assumed, and many social democrats have assumed, that the primary problem with market-driven globalization is simply a matter of distributive justice. Those who have gained from new technologies and global trade have not adequately compensated those who have lost out. There's truth in that, but it's not the only problem. And it misunderstands the populist complaint. Conducting our public discourse as if it were possible to outsource moral and political judgment to markets, to let them define what counts as a valuable contribution to the common good. This is what empties democratic argument of meaning and purpose. And vacuums of public meaning are invariably filled by harsh authoritarian forms of identity and belonging, whether in the form of religious fundamentalism or strident nationalism. That is what we are witnessing today, four decades of market-driven globalization have hollowed out public discourse, disempowered ordinary citizens, and prompted a backlash that would clothe the naked public square with an intolerant, vengeful nationalism. So to reinvigorate democratic politics, to reinvigorate social democratic politics, we need to affirm Rawls's critique of a market way of conceiving justice. We need to continue to embrace his emphasis on distributive justice. But we also need to go beyond Rawls's version of liberalism to acknowledge the indispensability of arguments that appeal to conceptions of the good life, to what we share as democratic citizens. And we need to take seriously the corrosive effects of meritocratic competition and market definitions of what counts as a valuable contribution to the common good. We need to take seriously the corrosive effect of these, way of, these ways of thinking on the social bonds that constitute our common life. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, this was very, very inspiring. Great thank you. Um, please, um, yeah, if you sit there, and Karl Lauterbach, please, here. Yes, I'm um, pleased uh, that I can welcome um, to, uh, uh, to, to, to members of our discussion group. So to speak, first of all, Susan uh, Neyman. Nein. Nein. Uh, she is a philosopher. She was an assistant philosopher with uh, John Rawls in, in Harvard, and she is now head of the um, Einstein Forum in Potsdam, here uh, close to Berlin. Um, and Karl Lauterbach, he is a politician, uh, and, and he studied as well in Harvard. Hi. Um, so um, let me start by saying that I, I, I think I agree with everything you just said. And I was really interested to note that this is the most Rawlsian book you've ever written, uh, as far as I can see, because um, Rawls's claim that we don't deserve our talents or our um, inclinations or our um, capacity for risk, which was something that was, it took me a long time to get. <laughs> it was in my 40s before I realized that people have different tolerance for risk, because mine is rather high. Um, so that all of those things are contingencies that should not enter into any questions of justice. It's, um, it's a very deep point. It was counterintuitive 50 years ago. And you're absolutely right that it's become even less counterintuitive in the 50 intervening years. I also think you're right that at least we had a moment in which Corona made it clear that people like you and I, who were fortunately sitting at home and locked down and could Zoom with our friends or colleagues, um, 
weren't essential. It was a, it was a really sh deep moment to you know, realize, no, the, the person who really matters is the grocery store clerk or the nursery, at least here, at least a lot of nursery schools were still open at various times, um, nurses. None of these people, however, uh, even in this country, which is a less unequal country than the US, um, is being paid enough to really, I mean, they're sort of hanging on to the bottom rung of the middle class. And that's clearly something that needs to be changed. Um, you know, of course, there are a lot of differences from, as you know, from the German system to this one. For one thing, there are very few private universities and they don't play a role, uh, the kind of role that they play in the States. And, um, you know, the other thing is, it, for a very long time, a university diploma has not been seen as uh, the qualification for decent work. We have a very interesting system of apprenticeships in all kinds of fields that you would get a university degree for in the States. And by and large, it works well. But I have a couple of questions. Um, I don't think talking about the dignity of work is going to get us very far. I think it's going to begin sounding like, I don't know what kind of feedback you've gotten in the US about the book. I think that a lot of people will um, you know, nod to it and say it might help us get back the Trump voters, maybe. Um, but I don't think it's enough. There was a passage uh, in your book where you talk about the ideal of civic learning. I think you end by you know, talking about we could, whatever, whether we're professors or carpenters, share, we could share in a widely diffused culture of learning, deliberating with fellow citizens about public affairs, which is a beautiful vision. Um, it would take a lot to put it into practice. And once again, the very strong German support for public culture is the kind of thing that makes a beginning in that direction, more than a beginning, I think. And it's something that's absolutely lacking in the United States. You also talked about the um, uh, early union organization of workers, reading circles, and all of that, very beautiful stories. Um, as you know, as, at least as well as I, the unions have basically been destroyed in the United States. And I think what it would take to bring them back is um, a much broader scope than, um, you know, is clear to me in your arguments. Now, I just happen at the moment to be working on George Eliot and writing something about her. Um, and uh, she, she's not very well known in Germany, although Middlemarch got two translations a couple of years ago, but um, American readers will know her and know that the dignity of work was one of her guiding themes. She did not come from the gentry. She came basically from a working class family. But when she talks, in the very beginning of Adam Bede, uh, the very first scene is Adam Bede is a carpenter. He's the hero of, for those who don't know the book, um, he's the hero of the book. And they're sitting in the carpentry workshop and he is the one who cares about his work, okay? He is the others all want to lay off because it's time to go and they'd like to get their dinners. And he says in this very broad dialogue, what are, you know, what, are, what are you doing? The work isn't done and we have to do it well. And, and this is a sort of guiding ethos. I'm not sure how to genuinely bring that ethos back. And I have also noticed um, partly, yeah, different kinds of experiences that it seems rather to be one of those things that may be inborn and not something that politicians coming from the outside talking about the dignity of work can actually change. So I wonder if you have any further thoughts about how to develop that, because I think we need both um, you know, material changes, 
but I that that you don't mention and that certainly wouldn't be satisfied by you know a lot of politicians simply saying is of course the SPD does genuinely we respect every worker um, you know whether they have a college degree whether they speak another language whether they're uh, you know earn a lot of money um, so something structurally needs to change but I worry a lot about the the ways in which it seems to me that a commitment to honest work and effort is really quite variable and it's not clearly tied to anybody's crummy circumstances. Anybody's growing up in a terrible home or uh, being traumatized or having parents who don't read books. There are people who work their ways out of that situation. And uh, yeah, I feel like many, uh, sorry, maybe last point, um, interested me very much that you tie this to Rawls's uh, prioritizing the right over the good. I thought you were gonna talk about your, you know, older critique of Rawls, which I don't actually agree with, but uh, this is one facet of Rawls that I always felt extremely uncomfortable with because uh, I, I, you could put a gun to my head, and I don't think you'd get me to say that Kim Kardashian's conception of the good is, you know, just as valuable as an emergency room doctor or a great writer or, you know, any of the many things that really do contribute to the society. And Rawls really does require us, if we're taking him seriously, to be agnostic about that and say Kim Kardashian's uh, conception of the good is, is uh, is equally valuable, but my question is what, what are the limits? Um, you know, there, something about Rawls's intuition, and that's his liberalism, that people ought to be able to, people ought to be free to choose their own conceptions of a good life. Something about that is appealing. Now, we are, as you said, living in a world where a particular conception of the good, which was already certainly absolutely present in 1971, but it's gone haywire today, um, that has overrun the world to the point where other kinds of values are very hard to get taken seriously. People roll their eyes when you talk about the common good and they call it kitsch and all kinds of things. Um, what are, do you see any limits to saying, um, no, we're going to put certain conceptions of the good first? And could you describe the conception of the, I mean, I think I know what it is roughly from reading a lot of your work, but um, could you just spell out what the conception of the good is that you would like us to prioritize? Right. Uh, may, 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 Matthias, may I reply now, or yes, yes, how I should we proceed? Yes, to hear your answers to this question. Yes. Okay. These <laughs> these are fascinating challenges from uh, Susan, and in a way, they all focus on really the central question at stake, and that has to do with the status of arguments about the good the common good, the character of the good life in politics. Rawls's liberalism, for the reasons Susan rightly emphasized, wants to keep contested conceptions of the good life outside of politics. I think that's a mistake. I think it's a mistake to insist on the priority of the right over the good. And let me connect that to the challenges or the questions Susan posed about the political implications of all of this. My argument uh, against this, this idea of being neutral toward the good life is not only that it makes for impoverished public discourse, but that it leads us to overlook the implicit reigning conceptions of the good largely consumerist conceptions 
that are the default, seemingly neutral position if democratic citizens don't take up that question directly. In a market-drenched consumerist society like ours, it's not that we can keep conceptions of the good life out of public life and civic life. It's the consumerist market-defined conceptions of the good will predominate unless political initiative and democratic public deliberation insists otherwise. Now, Susan began by saying she, she warmed to the fact that this was my most Rawlsian book because I agree with Rawls's argument against meritocracy. The, the difference is this. Rawls argued that we don't deserve our talents. They're contingent or matter of good luck. And I find that persuasive. But it's important to notice that someone else who made exactly the same argument was Hayek. Mm -hmm. So rejecting moral desert, rejecting the idea that we deserve the benefits the market bestows on our talent is, is not sufficient to make for social democratic politics. Hayek embraced it. And he drew libertarian free market political implications. Rawls drew redistributive welfare state implications. And if we look at the what's been missing from social democratic politics in recent decades, we can trace it to this defect, as I see it, in Rawls's argument. It's not enough simply to say, as Rawls and Hayek both say, our talents are contingent and that they're valued in the marketplace is not our doing. That's an important first step. But we also therefore have to say that in order to decide how to organize our, a shared public life, we have to reason about the good. We have to reason about whose contributions in the labor market really do contribute most. That takes us directly, Susan, onto the terrain of the good. Now, I think you're conflicted in a wonderfully honest, philosophically resonant way. You're conflicted as you described it, between the appeal of Rawls's liberalism, not wanting to impose the values of some on those who don't share those values, but you also are uneasy about his assertion of the priority of the right, his being agnostic for political purposes on which values a society valorizes and prizes. I want to kind of build on your discomfort with Rawls's attempt to articulate a liberalism of neutrality toward the good. And I want to invite you to consider the possibility that what's gone wrong with social democratic politics, the reason it's lost its capacity to inspire is that it has lacked a vocabulary of the common good. And this is connected to the dignity of work. Now you rightly press me for concrete implications, let me give you one or two. Take the debate about taxes, let's say. Suppose the Social Democratic Party says, earnings from labor should not be taxed at a higher rate than earnings from dividends and capital gains, not only for reasons of distributive justice, but also because Earnings when people who learn who work and earn are making a more valuable contribution than people who engage, let's say, in high-speed trading or highly speculative casino-like financial dealings. This is a judgmental argument. This is an argument about what contributions really matter most. This is an argument that is not neutral about the value of casino-like financial speculation on the one hand, and building things and making things and caring for people who, and restoring them to health on the other. 
So here is a concrete policy implication of how I think social democratic politics needs to move beyond the liberalism of neutrality, needs to move beyond a single-minded Um, and uh, I do think, partly because Rawls himself, as all of us who knew him, was such, an, such a non-market person and such an incredibly good man, I think yeah. it was probably hard for him to conceive, as you just put it, which is very helpful, that if we're agnostic about conceptions of the good in this world, um, the market will provide the default conception of the good. Um, and, and that's a development that I just don't think for personal more than historical reasons he could have foreseen. Yeah. I agree yeah. with you that it's a problem uh, for social democrats. I sat in this very place some, whatever it was, five years ago. Um, one of the nice things about the SPD here is they actually like having conversations with philosophers and politicians. Um, and begging somebody to take seriously the idea that that social democrats need to inspire and need to appeal to ideals and not just pocketbooks and i was shouted down by a lot of people um so i entirely agree with you i find your way of putting it now very helpful just one last question if you can and i i doubt you'll be able to um answer it and who can how in the world that we live in could, how practically can we attempt, we're never gonna convince Donald Trump of anything, but um, with that now being the default position, the default conception of the good for very many people, what can we do against it? Maybe, Michael, yeah, we open up the discussion a little bit now, and I'm happy to, to ask Karl Lauterbach, because you already moved into the politics from this great philosophical uh, theory. Um, I, I would like to ask him not only if he's the next health minister of Germany, which is obviously, <laughs> no, but um, uh, seriously, we are searching for a, a just society today. And the question is, do we need a new politics of the common good? Well, uh, if you allow me, first of all, um, I, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity and I should say hello to Michael Sandel, whom I have always admired, despite the fact that I never agreed with your opinions. And uh, I would like to take the opportunity and to perhaps elaborate uh, within a couple of sentences. I was at Harvard in the early 90s and uh, I worked with Amasha Sen and uh, um, dealt a lot with basically uh, John Rawls's work and your uh, liberalism and the uh, limits of uh, justice. And uh, what I have, all, uh, just briefly my background, I come from a working class family, I'm closely connected to the work of a professor, a member of parliament, uh, um, physician and so forth, so there's a wide, so I can basically see exactly how working class people respond to the privileged people, the class I belong to nowadays, and I'm also in politics, and uh, I try to do as good as I can in order to make the life of poor and disprivileged people as good as possible, and have to deal with the far right in that respect. So in many ways, I'm practically involved in uh, what your work is about, and I will briefly elaborate what I have always believed, uh, why my own more or less Kantian outlook and Waltzian outlook um, is in conflict with what I understood your communitarian view to be. I have never doubted that for a better society, you have to have a, a vision of the good, a conception of the good. A society which is impoverished, a meritocratic, let's say, uh, lean society with no shared values is, is really an impoverished uh, uh, society. And it is not a society in which social democratic parties can flourish. There is no disagreement about that. But the, dis uh, uh, the conception of the good should be the principle by which questions of 
distributive justice and opportunity should be dealt with. So I have always believed that, let's say, a Kantian view, uh, Rawls's Kantian view of, let's say, uh, opportunity principle and difference principle, that this can be derived more or less from a Kantian perspective and should be, let's say, guiding in all uh, societies, no matter what the conception of good is. And we need a, 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 what Bernard Williams would call a sick version of the good in order to live a good life, to live in a good society. That was all. So the difference is not whether we should have a vision of the good. Here I would immediately agree. We need, a, in order to have a good life, we need to live in a good society, and a good society is a society in which there is a conception of the good which many people share. And meritoc meritocracy does not count as such a vision. But when it comes to the basic principles of justice, the opportunity principle, the, uh, let's say, priority of the worst off, I've always looked at this as distinct, completely distinct, from the question what the good life should be. And uh, that, for me, was basically the disagreement in those days. And I under always understood your work and also work, let's say, in that, let's say, uh, corridor like Ch Charles Taylor or uh, even, let's say, Aristotelian people that, let's say, even these basic principles of re distributive justice are up for distribution or up for decision, uh, so completely independent. So we should, for example, live in a good society where, it, where we should not um, make laws governed by the principle we have to deal with the interests and the needs of the worst of first. That's the difference. That's, that's, that's where I originally saw the difference. And even in your newer work, I apologize if I misunderstand the, the work, I see this problem unsolved. This is, let's say, where, now coming to my personal work, I've always uh, seen, uh, I've always believed, uh, let's say, dealing with people that respect is, let's say, uh, a necessary condition for, impoverished people or disadvantaged people or people with not so many talents, that this is a necessary condition for them to be seen, that they themselves see themselves as part of the society and conceive the society as good. But it is only a necessary condition that is not a, it is not a, a condition which fulfills the needs. And let's say the redistributive questions, the questions that Rawls was mostly focusing on, that does the work. If I, for example, look at the pandemic, we have, let's say, been very uh, generous with, 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 with regard to respect towards the nurses. And also, for example, to the people who, let's say, uh, were able to keep things going. But ultimately, they are now disappointed because the money is not forthcoming. We are not paying. And in a Rawlsian uh, uh, society, we would basically provide them with what they deserve and uh, what we deserve, to, what we actually, sh what we owe them, as, as a matter of fact. So that is, the, that is where I see, let's say, the, the difference uh, in principle in philosophy, but also in my practical work, that ultimately a fair distribution of opportunities and a fair oppor uh, distribution, let's say, of resources, that does, that does the work. And uh, in, also in my, let's say, uh, uh, um, conception of what is going on in the US, I think, let's say, the unfairness of the educational system, the unfairness of the opportunities, the unfairness of the uh, income uh, situation, that is doing more damage than, uh, in my opinion at least, and I'm not an expert with respect to the American society, I should say. But this is, in my opinion, doing more damage than, let's say, not, con not conceiving these people as valuable people and respecting them in, 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 in a way that would, uh, would be needed. Um, one more question to Karl Lauterbach, please. Um, I mean, listening to your critics to, uh, to Michael Sandel's position, um, wouldn't you agree that you already, or the SPD campaign already, had a big profit from his inspiration? Uh, uh, listening to the respect claim, for example, which was uh, the fulfillment of this uh, of this of this position, in my view. 
Absolutely, and uh, I should be uh, I should thank Michael Sandel be basically providing important ideas to Olaf Scholz because yeah. he used a lot of these respect uh, visions. Uh, correctly and uh, successfully, and I'm not saying that respect uh, is unnecessary or it's not working and so forth. But uh, my point is, let's say, we, uh, we have to go beyond respect. And where we have to go beyond respect, in my opinion, is uh, where John Rawls has led the way, and this is, this is my opinion, basically, that in the long run, um, it is the opportunities in the long run, it is, for example, uh, an equal access to health care. In the long run, it is, let's say, a fair income distribution. And uh, ne nevertheless, uh, apart from that, we need a conception of the good life. And the conception of the good life includes respect and includes a vision of the good life, which is uh, not meritocracy. Michael, you would agree, definitely. So, well, yeah, this is a, it's a very important and subtle difference that Professor uh, Lauterbach has, has raised and articulated very powerfully. And uh, the heart of the disagreement is Professor Lauterbach uh, said that the, he believes in the importance of a good society. And he also believes in the importance of principles of justice that provide for fair equality of opportunity. But he believes that these are completely distinct. And my argument is that they are not completely distinct. To the contrary, they are mutually dependent. A conception of the good society and a conception of justice. Now, here's why. Let's. Uh, let's begin with where we left off. When Olaf Scholz emphasized respect in the campaign, and here I'm speaking as an outside observer, all of you are more familiar with the nuances than I am. My impression is that what he meant by respect, or at least what resonated in his uh, language of respect, is that he wasn't speaking only of Kantian respect for persons as persons. He was also gesturing toward a politics of recognition. What the reason I think, the reason I disagree with Professor Lauterbach on, on conceptions of justice and conceptions of a good society being completely distinct, the reason I think that's a mistake is that the case for justice and for redistribution, it depends on a politics of recognition. What's at stake is not only income support and health care and the fair opportunity to compete in the market. What's at stake is the allocation of social recognition and esteem and honor. Now, what kinds of goods are social recognition and honor and esteem? Are they part of justice or are they part of the good society? I don't think it's possible to drive those two considerations apart, to determine whose contributions are worthy of recognition and esteem and honor requires a conception of what's valuable, which requires a, a vocabulary of the good. That's to do with the good society. And yet allocating social roles and rewards in a way that supports a politics of recognition, that allocates honor, social recognition, and esteem appropriately, that's a matter of justice. That's not irrelevant to the question of justice. This, I think, is the heart of the matter. This is why I think it's a mistake to consider as completely distinct questions of justice on the one hand and questions of the good society and how to value goods and how to allocate honor and recognition on the other. Okay, thank you, Michael. First, um, Susan has, has one remark, I think. But, uh, yeah, okay. I, I would like to uh, answer directly. By the way, I think 
this is a very important uh, question. I've thought about this uh, a lot, and I'm not quite sure. To, just to make uh, clear that, let's say, this is for me all. This has always been work in progress. But uh, I give you an example. Eh? I frequently think about these issues in my work. So. Uh, it is not, uh, this is not a theoretical, but, uh, and I, I, for example, very often in my profession have to deal with people, con when, if I look at my conception of the good and the conception of the good, which is roughly speaking the shared conception of the, job in, uh, the good in our society, I would say we deserve them literally from the conception of the good, nothing, absolutely nothing. They put others at risk, lean towards the criminal, and are in many other ways, and I have to deal with on a daily basis, simply in my work, as a matter of fact, they are not, I mean, on, I, I have a hard time to think of any conception of the good where I would, let's say, be in a position to say, well, we owe them something. But nevertheless, as a matter of justice, they have the same claim. And if they I meaning who? Referring to whom? Well, for example, people um, who try selling drugs to make younger mm. children addicted yeah. to drugs. And uh, I could yeah. go beyond that. I could, uh, I could, yeah, I, yeah. I could, uh, in my, for my, for my daily work, as a matter of fact, I could go beyond these, let's say, uh, examples, literally, yeah. could go beyond. So what, what do we owe these people when they come, for example, for health care, which they come all the time? From the perspective of a conception of the good, I mean, uh, I, that is a very, short, a very short answer. But from the perspective of a Rawlsian, uh, and of, therefore very often Rawlsians are criticized because this lean, uh, let's say bloodless perception that we owe, let's say we, that we owe them the same. We, these people, we owe, we owe the same opportunities to exactly these people. I mean, that is obviously something that is provocative. But in my own, own opinion, being convinced that let's say the rough conception of the of the just, what is fair, what is not so fair which I regard as almost in the tradition of Norman Daniels as something that is species typical. So I think we have, we, we, luckily, we have a conception of, of fairness and uh, we have a conception of justice independent of the conception of the good. If we were based on the conception of the good exclusively, these, po these people would see nothing, strictly nothing. So. You may be right, and I've already mentioned that I'm not quite sure if I'm correct with my views. I, I, uh, I, I think about these issues very often, but I'm not sure if my, posi if my position is correct. But uh, possibly I would say, uh, at least I would go as that far, that let's say the conception of justice and the conception of the good, that is, it, at, at least is to a large degree independent. I'm not sure if it is completely independent. I'm also not sure if I'm under an obligation to, let's say, make the claim that it is completely independent. I'm not sure about that. But I think, let's say, it may well be that we have, let's say, a, 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 a shared ground for conception of the good, that all conceptions of the good have some shared, let's say, common ground. All serious conceptions of the good have some shared common ground, like a, 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 a Aristotelian common ground, which is somehow in us, and that we have a, a much clearer view of what okay. is just and what is not just. That's, that's my opinion. Okay. Susan, would you, would you like to add your question or formulate it? Yeah, I, um, I want to go back um, to the distinction between the right and the good, Michael, because I, I, I am really struck by... Um, the importance of your claim about default conceptions of the good. I, I think that's a really important and deep point. And one might even say, I don't know whether you'd agree, that the good and the right are connected because only a certain conception of the good will get you to enter the original position in the first place. That yes, is, yes. Yeah, okay. yes. Yeah, so 
um, you know, unless you have a commitment to a certain kind of justice and solidarity, you're not going to take up this conception of the right. But let me just tell you why I'm still a bit uneasy. I mean, I'm a very grateful Rawls student, but I'm not, you know, I'm by no means a Rawlsian. I, I don't focus most of my work on, you know, uh, you know, working out the, I don't focus any of my work working out in, the implications of theory of justice or any of that. Um, I think my uneasiness with your wanting to put the two together, or rather my inclination to take, um, to feel that Rawls is right about distinguishing the right and the good, probably has to do with the fact that I personally have a very strong conception of the good, which I'd be tempted if someone let me to impose it on the world, and I'm not sure that that's correct. And I want to bring up one point. Let's not forget that Rawls was trying to find um, a left-wing way, but a philosophical way, to distinguish between capitalism and communism, okay? We're talking 71, and while I, um, I do not join the chorus of all of the people who now believe that there was absolutely nothing good in real existing socialism, there are many people, the further we get away from it, who are reminding us that uh, a lot of societies lost quite a bit when they gave away even this very imperfect and sometimes perverted version of socialism. But one thing that most people from Eastern Europe complain about is the idea that they were not free to choose their own conceptions of the good. That there was this very strong, overarching social conception of the good life and contributing to the community and that they felt oppressed by that. Now, of course, many of them 30 years later feel oppressed by capitalism in a different way, but I just wonder if you have a response to the worry, to that worry. And may I quickly re reply, please, please, um, uh, Matthias? We started five I minutes agree. later, but you have uh, your time to, to make your last statement. Well, directly to Susan, I would agree that those who lived in the Soviet bloc um, and in Eastern Europe during the days of the Berlin Wall were not free. The question is, were they not free because they weren't able to choose their ends for themselves? Or were they not free because they weren't able to share in self-rule? in having a voice, in deliberating about common purposes and ends. So there, there are two ways of describing the lack of freedom. The first, emphasizing individual choice of, of the good, uh, it slides easily into a consumerist conception of freedom, which is the, the back to the default conception of freedom that has predominated in market societies. Whereas the second concept, the second account of the sense in which they were unfree is more to do with a civic Republican account, a civic conception of freedom, which says, I'm not free only insofar as I can exercise my rights as a consumer. The choosing conception of freedom Full freedom requires that I participate with fellow citizens in deliberating about the common good, the meaning of a just society. And they lacked that freedom too. And so I think that's a more demanding conception of freedom and one that stands as a persisting challenge, even after the end of the Cold War, a persisting challenge to those of us who are free in the consumerist sense, but who, and this I think is true of public life generally, sense that we are less and less in control of the forces that govern our lives, that the average citizen today does not have a meaningful say in how we are governed, that the civic project is impoverished. And my suggestion 
is that social Democrats need to address that hollowness in the civic project. This connects, Susan, to what you were saying earlier about social Democrats need to be inspiring. But for, for social democratic public discourse to resonate, to be inspiring, I think requires that it talk not only about equal access to consumer to the consumer society, not only about distributive justice, not only about even fair equality of opportunity, important though that is, but I think for social democratic politics to resonate, it has to appeal to a sense of community, a sense of belonging, and a sense of a shared civic project that empowers, that reigns, that calls to economic account, uh, calls to democratic account, economic forces that now exceed our control and that enables citizens to believe and to have a share in self-government. This is a more demanding conception of freedom. And I don't think the liberal conception of distributive justice by itself can deliver it. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I would like to ask you one more question from the audience because we do have a chat here. And um, you, you saw that uh, you have two opponents, Kantianian opponents here, and uh, this question goes in the same direction. It is, can a liberal state really tell the people uh, what the good life is? And uh, I would like to ask you for, for quite a short uh, answer for that question. The liberal state should not tell citizens what the good life is. A pluralist uh, state, a pluralist public life it does not tell citizens that they may not bring their conceptions of the good life into the public square. That, I think, is its own kind of tyranny. It should not tell citizens that their substantive moral and spiritual convictions are irrelevant when it comes to engaging in public discourse. I think that's been the mistake. And it's a mistake that I do think goes all the way back to John Rawls's version of liberalism, powerful and inspiring though it, uh, it was in many respects. And I think there's a lot of agreement among the three of us here about that. But I think the mistake is to insist on the strictures, the restraints of liberal public reason as defined by Rawls and Habermas in the Kantian tradition. I think that has hampered social democratic politics. I think it's contributed to the hollowing out of public discourse, to the lack of resonance. People want, democratic citizens rightly want public life to be about big questions, including questions of values, including questions, Professor Lauterbach, about the nature of the good society. These are political questions. They're not pre-political. They're not independent of debates about justice. My suggestion is that to revitalize social democratic politics, we need to embrace rather than avoid the distinctive goods our different lives express and to welcome competing conceptions of the good life into the public life, into public discourse among democratic citizens. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, three of you. I think this was a very inspiring discussion. Thank you very, very much. And it did not only show, but it proved how important philosophy still is. It works and is very important for society and for politics. Thank you so much. It was very inspiring having you here. Michael, uh, goodbye. We have to close this panel and we will start the second panel immediately. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Genau, wir machen ein... Yes, exactly. Some people will change their seats up here on the panel, and I would like to thank Susan Neyman and Karl Lauterbach most cordially, and also thanks very much to Michael Sandel, who has got to leave us now, but I think his ideas are going to keep us busy. We've now changed to German and will continue in German.
which is not a problem to all the participants at all. And now, we would like to continue to keep on discussing these topics, which are quite civil or philosophical. The right and the good and the concept of the good society. We want to break it down a little bit further by asking ourselves what needs to be done at the political level in order to be able to give shape to this just society, or however we would like to define it. On to the next speakers. We'd like to ask two more guests to join us up here on the stage. Hort Kron and Paul Nemitz, please join us here up on the stage. Let me introduce the speakers to you very briefly. Let me start off with Gord Korn. She works with the concept work New Economy. She works on the topics of climate justice and public relations. The concept work is dealing new with new ways of working. In order to promote a decent life for all, this is where the decent life comes in again. We are looking forward to her explaining to us what it means, and it puts a particular focus on the social ecological transformation. We're happy to have you here, Mrs. Kroon, and I would also like to welcome Paul Nemitz. He is Chief Advisor to the EU Commission. He deals with questions relating to digitization, data privacy, artificial intelligence in democracy. He's a guest professor at the European College in Bruges. And in 2020, together with Matthias Pfeffer, he published a book which is called Prinzip Mensch, Right, Ethik and Democracy in Zeitalter der Künstlichen Intelligenz. Principal human being, the right ethics and democracy in the age of artificial intelligence. Thanks very much to you. This event goes back to an initiative that you started, and we were very glad to take it up in the Friedrich Ebert Foundation and bring that many renowned guests together tonight. Let's start off up here on the panel, but of course, we will take up your questions from the chat. And it is now our important task to break this intriguing philosophical debate a little bit down to the following aspects. Now, Mrs. Nyman, let me ask you first and foremost, when you recap on this debate, a lot of important terms were used which also crop up in social democratic policies, dignity of work, decent work. What are the most important recommendations that you would like to pass on to the negotiating partners which are about to form a coalition? That's quite interesting, you see, because I do not always agree with Michael Sandel. Today I did, though, especially with a view to this particularly important point. A just society needs a conception of the good. On one of the previous events, I don't really recall when it was, I think it was shortly before the last election campaign, when I passionately argued for social democratic values to be promoted, heralded and advocated, and people told me that I'd be a blue-eyed, naive, American idealist, Kantian, whatever. But, you know, that's what it all boiled down to at the end of the day. It's all about people having more in their pockets, and the Social Democrats need to promise people to earn more money, stop paying lip service to the voters. Now, now we won the election without many inspiring personalities. This was mentioned time and again. This is nothing new. And nothing terrible to say either, but in order to reach what we are all striving for and in order to accomplish what we all expect a social democratic government to strive for, you have to really get rid of your fear of Sunday speeches and lip services and empty phrases and move on to a very clear conceptualization of a good society, of the good. He's as American as I am, but he's not a follower of Kant. But he spoke about the fact that we're eroded and hollowed out in many Western European democracies. You feel this in the general public. Many people 
turn to fanatic nationalist trends or fanatic types of religious groupings, especially because we as leftist liberals have stopped talking about values and the good. That to me is the most important recommendation given to us by Sanders. Thanks very much. Let me pass this on to Karl Lauterbach. Let us once again put a very strong focus on values and the moral substance, as Susan Neumann said. And let me bring this into connection with the question you are part of the team in as a common consensus that you can all agree on. Can you pursue a joint justice concept with the red green? We can easily agree on thin conceptions of what is good, but it is very difficult to agree on thick conceptions. But I'm still not convinced of what Michael Sandler has said. Maybe I can. I have to look at his theory in greater detail, but I think it's an illusion to say that in society, by and large, you can pursue one single conception of the good. We're living in a completely pluralist society different religious belongings. We have people who are in conflict with each other. We have a meritocratic group within society, which is very strong. We have another group in society, which um, partly pursues ideals that not all of us share, who are rather conservative and rather right-wing. And if I try to describe the conception of the good, which is still possible in Germany today, what remains? What is left? And this was also the basic idea of Rawls' idea to say that we cannot agree on that. We need a pluralism of the good. A pluralism of the good. How can we prevent this from being a fact of attacked? So it's a very thin conception where justice is based on two principles, because otherwise we have to struggle each other very hard. And unfortunately, I've got to put it this way, but I'm still convinced of these old ideals which are based on Kant, but maybe I overlooked something. What really convinced me was Sandal's claim when he said that if we are neutral vis-a-vis -vis terms of the good, then we're in a default position with the market about the situation that was, I was in one of the previous Eva foundations. People only wanted to speak about money. That's when I was shouted down. It was believed to be possible to catch the voters only if you promise them more money, more earnings, better income. And all the different ideas and conceptions between the good and the bad were completely unacceptable. And this is why I thought this was rather convincing. A thin conviction, conception, it depends on how thin it is. When I was wondering about it, I was thinking that the willingness to use a Rosian term for justice and accepting it presupposes that we come up with a thicker conception than you might think. Well, that is basically what it all boils down to. I think this is something which is something that we are born with. It's nothing that you learn. You observe different approaches to justice also amongst primates. You, in simple terms, you know, I know that you can look at this from different angles. But if that was so, if that was predominantly something that we were born with, because little babies who do not have any idea of what's good have a pretty good feeling for justice when they need to share. Studies reveal this rather clearly. And that is something that we are born with without any wrong conceptions of the good. And if the concepts of the good are appealing, leftist conception of the good an appealing position, then this conception might also seem to be plausible. But I can also imagine and conceive conceptions of the God which are less plausible and less attractive. And, you know, maybe 
we are spoiled by the good times that we live in. I hope that you are right, but I'm not fully on your page. I think that it will not be possible for us during this panel to answer this big one. And now let me move over to the very specific and to the bad question relating to justice that we've got to deal with at the current moment in time. The life, the world is different from what it was like 50 years ago when Rawls came up with a theory, the Glasgow Climate COP is currently taking place in Glasgow. And here the question of justice surfaced in a completely different way with a different sense of urgency. Now let me ask Mrs. Cohn, from your particular angle, what are the big questions concerning justice in connection with climate change and how are they all interconnected? Thank you very much for this interesting question. It's a very important one, and my answer will be incomplete. You can believe me that one. But I would like to allude to some of the aspects which are relevant to me in this context. What kind of justice crises are we in? Questions of justice and climate change. To which extent are they interconnected? And how can we talk about climate justice? We do need to look at the society where the climate crisis occurs and which effects it has. I think this was mentioned several times before, but I would like to look at this from a rather global angle. Right now, we are living in neoliberal capitalist societies. Capitalism has led to a certain level of wealth, which has been accompanied right from the beginning by processes of placation of men and nature, colonial types of exploitation which still exist in our econo economic and social structures. What's quite particularly striking is that this wealth within societies and at global scale is distributed unevenly, and this is a central problem of justice of our age. The rich between the, the between the rich and the poor is widening. The richest one percent of the world owns fifty percent of global wealth. And if you compare this, then we in our society afford super rich people to have billions in their accounts, but we still accept that at the bottom line, people are not allowed to claim social allowances. In recent months, we were told how billionaires embarked on a race into space, but other people don't have access to vaccines or fatal necessary drugs because people in the North want to use their patents in order to make even more profit. What do I want to aim at? Resources in the capitalist society are being used and redistributed in order to make profit, and we do not focus so much on the needs of people, which might lead to a decent life of all. One additional aspect in this context is that the way in which resources are distributed and those who own wealth have wealth and participation and can be represented is not a random distribution, but it is very clearly structured based on power in our sector, and they're intersectorally interconnected. What do I mean by that? I'm a woman I'm of white skin, born in Northern Europe. I grew up in patriarchal structures. I'm not that much represented in political and economic elites. I'm economically at a disadvantage through the gender payback. And this leads to the way in which property and wealth are distributed. But its intersectoral connection makes sure that if I'm living in this society, I will get marginalized much stronger. If I'm a black woman, transgender, and if certain rights are denied to them due to my nationality, the right of the freedom of movement, for example, I will be marginalized or sidelined even further, and I will be discriminated in society by and large. It's very important to bear that in mind. It's a systematic devaluation of certain groups of society in our systems and globally as well. But this serves a particular purpose. This is closely connected to our economic structures and how they work, and due to the systematic devaluation systems of exploitation gets strengthened and stabilized. It's important to realize that people who are most marginalized are particularly vulnerable towards social crises, and that is particularly important when we look at the effects of the climate crisis in our society. And I'm talking about a climate crisis. It would be better to say the ecological crisis, because the climate crisis is not the only climate crisis that we have. Lots of biodiversity. We are currently working with new planetary boundaries. It looks a bit critical, but in order to keep it simple, I will stick with the climate crisis for the time being. So the climate crisis hits us all hard. 
with various different starting positions that I described before and leads to even more injustice. And there are two principles which are particularly relevant. The polluter pays principle. It was originally caused by countries of the global north, where particularly many generated CO2 emissions, in particular due to the wealthy, rich people. Now the climate crisis does not have a major effect on us, but in the countries of the global south, where people have contributed very little to the crisis. That's one thing. The other aspect which leads to this system of injustice is that people are hit particularly hard by the consequences of the climate crisis, which are marginalized in society and discriminated against anyway. And this is why they're particularly vulnerable to the crisis, and they have limited process of getting adjusted. Now, let me once again briefly talk about what the climate crisis really means and what it means for our society, because I do have the feeling that in political communication as well as in the media, there is limited understanding. I don't know whether it's not people not being in the know or whether it was political arrogance. I think I still have the feeling that we talk about the crisis as, as if it was a thing to happen in the future and as if it was still preventable. It has become a part of our reality, and this is what people become increasingly aware of. When you look at floodings and droughts in the summer, in front of our own doorstep, we realize that at global scale, the effects are even much more drastic. And the other thing is the big misunderstanding that I perceive is that we still have the feeling that the climate crisis can be stopped because the CO2 emissions will only show an effect in the next decade and reach the atmosphere where the climate crisis will be aggravated. So things will become worse and we can no longer influence that. But what can we do? We very often talk about the fact that we want to limit the rise in temperature to 1.5 percent. It's essential that we do that. But what does it mean? Which measures have to be taken? How do societies have to change economies? What technical innovations do we need in a very short space of time in order to get there? Then I'm not very hopeful that we'll manage to limit global warming to 1.5 percentage points only. Even if I look at the political debate and the way in which it is waged, the political debates and the exploratory papers, no party manifesto or no proposals were made which are in conformity with the 1.5 degrees. We all think about budgets exceeding the 1.5 degree goal. Depending on the parties, of course, there are some fluctuations. What's happening at global scale? When we look at the UN climate discussions, I'm even more pessimistic for decades. The state negotiations have led to the fact that climate discussions are completely blocked. From the perspective of justice, it's important to keep on fighting for climate justice. Every tenth degree is important. It doesn't matter whether the, it makes a difference whether the earth warms by 0.6 percent, uh, 0.6 degrees, or 1 percent, uh, 1 degree. But we have to talk about the way in which our society needs to transform. If we don't reach 1.5 degrees, if Tipping points in the climate system will be reached. How can we deal with that? So we will live in a society. Our environmental conditions will change profoundly. Extreme weather conditions will increase erratically. Parts of the world will be affected by heat, droughts, and floods, and will become inhabitable. We will have less land for arable agriculture, there will be harsher competition for resources and for food, and there will be ever greater scarcity in general. And the question is, what kind of society do we want to live in? On the basis of which principles do we want to allocate fewer resources? And who's going to decide on that? I think the climate crisis makes it more necessary than ever before to see to it that societies become more equal. And let me briefly tell you what it means in real political terms. First of all, in real politics, changes are of the essence. What can be implemented right now, but what doesn't suffice in order to reach climate justice? Effective climate protection, of course, which means a decline of energy intensive utilization of no social benefit. Of course, we need technical innovation, efficient, long life technological systems, which is a big problem in the climate debate. We still talk about a lot of technologies who are not yet available or associated with big risks with which we want to get the crisis under control, but we need fewer dangerous problems and more technological innovation, common goods, things that can be shared, should be shared. 
We need a shortage of working hours, reduction of production and consumption. We need democratization of corporations and more democratic participation of all the people who are affected by decision-making processes, and we need redistribution. I think a just society is the most important measure to get adjusted to climate, and these are measures such as property for the rich, for climate prevention, a property tax, a maximum income, a minimum income, and so on and so forth, in order to fill the wage gap. We also need that at global scale. This brings me to the end of my presentation. Historical climate prediction needs to be recognized. Regression has to be made poorly. We must have, must have a right to global mobility because if people can't move any longer, live in certain areas, then if we give them the possibility to move on, we need to do safe escape routes. And that's in order to have a safe and just society, we need another understanding of the economy and the purpose of our economy. We need to move away from profit-oriented, growth-driven, competitive economies, and we need to establish a needs-driven economic activity in order to fund our decent lives within our planetary boundaries. Thank you for this uh, large analytical statement here. Just uh, society in response to the climate crisis. We can discuss this in a minute, but I would now like to open up another great challenge in terms of justice. Um, Lord Korn just said that there's also systematic uh, exploitational structures and mechanisms. So, uh, Paul Nemitz, uh, what about the digital world? Large parts of our lives uh, now actually happen in the digital world. So what is digital justice? You have published on this. So what about the roles of digital room or digital area? Well, I think that wanting to shape uh, through democracy, shaping the world, that is part of the answer. Politics must not limit itself to try to make the market to work more efficiently. And uh, I also believe that we absolutely need to democratically shape the digital world. We saw that in Europe there was some time where we had a bit of uh, neoliberalism and uh, also this declaration of the independence of cyberspace, John Perry Varlow, all this uh, techno ideology saying that parliaments and laws are not necessary. We want to have open worldwide uh, internet that shouldn't be touched or affected by legislators and that then uh, was connected to neoliberalism and we saw this in Brussels and in America unfolding uh, large impact on legislation meaning that nothing much happened. And. Uh, Many philosophers uh, contributed these to these theories. We had long phases of ethical discussions about the digital world. I think we weren't even talking about uh, law. It was all about ethics. Now, this time is over. These times are over. That uh, does not work. We realized that we're talking about uh, real life power situations with large companies uh, not uh, very much impressed by ethics. And uh, now we are on the path towards the renaissance of a democratic shaping of this. Uh, we have all sorts of legislative measures at a European level. Why well, I'd say it's not by chance that these are being developed in times where in the south, but also in the north of Europe, social democrats are now flourishing again. So it's about uh, limiting, controlling power. So we have classical elements of strengthening uh, competition law. On the other hand, we have the platform economy, which is to be shaped uh, so as to be positive for democracy, because platforms are not just marketplaces. They are places where people uh, inform themselves, uh, um, shape their political opinions. We know that in America and also here, 50% of the population actually only form their opinion based on the internet. And uh, it's also about questions like access to data. What are the data being used for? And there's a commission proposal uh, for the Data Governance Act. In Germany, we had Andreas Nahles, who started the discussion that was really important, data for all. And that also uh, went into the Data Governance Act. 
So European data intermediaries should make it possible to use data for the common good and release us from the dependence uh, on American data silos like Facebook and Google. And especially when treating uh, personal data there, we have seen a huge redistribution from below to uh, up top. So big corporations and companies have grabbed the data and got very rich and very little went back into society. So I think this is one of the big uh, tasks for the future. Redistribution and justice should not just be seen in monetary terms, uh, in terms of budgets, but also in terms of having access to valuable, also personal, information. And I think that uh, this challenge will have to be met by the coalition agreement, but also European politics, and a lot is being done. Now, one thing on two terms. First of all, when we said that, uh, we talked about meritocracy, I remember when I was a child, Willy Brandt, uh, I mean, my mother was a co-founder of the University of Bremen, and social democrats were always for helping uh, workers' children to um, make a career through education. And uh, I am not for saying that university degrees are not so important. Willy Brandt had universities being built in the whole country so that uh, all sorts of people could have access to university ed education. And now we're living in a technological society where we actually need very many academics. Uh, we need this kind of qualification. And our strategy for the digital decade says that we need 20 million people in Europe who are professionals in information technology uh, because uh, you can learn it partially completely without going to university, especially programmers are very often natural talents, but we also need mathematicians, we need physicists, we need people who were very good at university. And uh, so I share all the crit criticism on total meritocracy as we heard it, but our the other end, um, I believe that we do need this principle of merit, for example, for access to public uh, positions and public service that does have uh, a lot of positive things to it. And the second point is that total plurality or relativism in society should not be accepted. What do I mean? There are topics in Europe, for example, questioning the institution of the state of law, the independence of uh, the justice systems. There we cannot just accept that everybody can have his own opinion and we can have diverse opinions on this, but we as social democrats will also have to then uh, break down this term of the good and say, okay, there are some principles of the institutions, for example, that we need independent judges where we just have to agree. And uh, we need common uh, principles. And also the same uh, holds true for the fact that democracy has to exist. And all this is being questioned in Europe nowadays. And we as social democrats, but also in philosophy, as philosophers, we should certainly strive to differentiate between those questions which are good for democratic pluralism and where you can uh, have different opinions and where you try to find majorities and other questions where we just have to insist that there cannot be other opinions, different opinions, and uh, this is the independence of judges, for example, and in Europe, this is important principle of justice, that European law breaks national law, including national constitutional law. Now, why is that so? Because if we say we want to have equal conditions of life and the equal rights in Europe, being protected, then you can't say that uh, some of the 27 member states of the European Union just uh, uh, makes exemptions and say, okay, we define this for ourselves, and that would then stop Europe from uh, working. And so we need Kant's categoric imperative here.
because if we say how is Europe going to work if every member state can define its own constitutional um, law saying that some of the areas can be regulated by euro but and others will be regulated only at a national level and i think that there's a lot to be done yet in this area thank you very much now lots have been put on the table here so now i'd like to pick up uh, two points i'd like to get back to uh, susan lyman and karl lauterbach one thing is these uh, inalienable principles you were talking about uh, the EU, and I'd like to hear from Mrs. Nyman, Mrs. Nayman, what she thinks about that. So, what do you think about what Paul Nemitz just said? Do you share his opinion? Especially when looking at Europe, or also from a philosophical standpoint. And then the other question uh, for Karl Lauterbach, uh, Paul Nimitz already picked up a question from the chat. So a question to the participants here. Do you believe that uh, this uh, part, the academization is part of this problem or should you do something against it? And I suppose uh, probably they mean even the party's position here. Well, I must admit that I didn't hear the second part of what you were saying because I was still thinking about the first part. So then why don't you react to the first part? Yeah, well, I took some notes here. Uh, maybe not your very first comments, but this critique so of meritocracy. Um, here, um, we're we had uh, the American critique, so social democratic structures, universities, the social state as such provide for much more equality, not just uh, in opportunities than uh, what uh, Michael Sandel can even imagine. No, sorry, Boris Sanders. Uh, he's right to the right of Angela Merkel. Uh, I've tried to explain that to many people if you look at the um, program. Now, as a university person, I cannot be, per se, against uh, an inclination towards more people going to university. I can for wish for all sorts of things, hoping it might be different, but uh, yeah, I'd like to... Um, say something on a personal note about John Rawls. He was probably the most generous person I have ever met and uh, very humble. He would be unimaginable in a German context where even the last professor in Erfurt has an image of himself that Rawls just didn't have, and that was really true. Uh, it was sincere, and he even quoted Kant, because there's a piece in the criticism of uh, pure um, of Kant, of Kant, where he says you sh you shouldn't even call yourself a philosopher because that would mean you've already reached uh, wisdom. And Rawls never called himself uh, a philosopher. And uh, something which I find is a, a paradox, because I live between Germany and the US, actually longer in Germany nowadays, there are social democratic structures, even in times where we had a Christian Democrat government. Uh, and uh, these structures are very stable, and they actually provide for more democracy. But what I do not understand is the psychological hierarchization and not just at uh, the universities where you see that uh, when social democrats you know how they react when you see a, a uh, so, uh, some politician 
an undersecretary coming, then you'd think you are still in feudal times, the way they behave. So I think that's a bit of a paradox. So we could probably achieve everything you she wanted to achieve when criticizing meritocracy if we could change these uh, kinds of attitudes. I'd also like to add to this now, I didn't know Hezama so well, but I did know him, and uh, he was so humble that he actually s was very soft-voiced. He didn't want to appear with a strong voice, and uh, quite a shocking moment, I remember, uh, has something to do with this topic of uh, meritocracy and uh, having a career through education. When I had Eric Sander, whom I actually uh, thought a lot of, that he thought that society might be more happy or better if everybody stayed where he was. Stay at your places. Yeah. That was the idea. And so that's why I was so surprised, because he had this uh, meta-ethical uh, structure, substructure for Rawls's work, which he had provided for, but uh, yeah, well, so this has uh, is connected with this. When people heard that, okay, people who've studied, they have studied because uh, they were privileged when born at birth, or others didn't make a career, well, if we could just live with that and say, okay, this uh, race of to the front, if we could give up on that, then maybe that was anyway the idea behind it, then the society might be happier and maybe it's true even and uh, well then I thought about it again and thought okay if you have a society which is meritocratic if it weren't meritocratic anymore then I think that would be very very unfair so I think that was a central idea of Rawls's this, these opportunities, and I don't believe that that uh, would be a problem for us, that the society rejects this as a principle. The problem is that uh, we uh, talk about this principle, but we don't live it, and that's what happens in America. So the meritocratic winners posing as such are actually people who have inherited privileges for which they did nothing. That's the scandal. So if uh, social democrats now made the mistake to react to that uh, by moving away from the idea, that would be terrible, I must say that. So I'm not convinced that uh, that is the core of uh, injustice. And uh, I believe uh, that Marcus Sandel was very much shaped by the American situation. He's uh, very good at writing uh, about this situation. These are things you would not see in Germany. For example, in Germany we have very successful craftsmen. Uh, they are very well trained and they know all sorts of things about electronics and uh, they earn more money than I do. Uh, but uh, So they're not envious of me and they don't think, oh, I wish I were there. No, they are very happy with what they're doing and uh, they see it's valuable and that's what it is. So if meritocracy works, and if we manage to have equal opportunities for children, that's the central point, then I believe that we can benefit strongly from society and we need meritocracy because otherwise we were not able to uh, face uh, the environmental problems and the challenge in digitization. So I'm still not really convinced. Now, one question maybe about this, um, which does not question what you both said here, but um, we saw that this uh, narrative of respect Olaf Scholz used actually worked very well. So one thing doesn't exclude the other, that you have, uh, so to speak, a meritocracy, and at the same time, you respect the different uh, kinds of contributions to the common good. So how can you strengthen that and implement it more now after the election campaign? So 
how is this uh, narrative of respect, respect uh, to be followed up? We were talking about dignity of work. So what will the substance be here? Well, I can say that in one sentence. We have uh, made incredibly large promises and we will have to fulfill them. Uh, action speaks more than words. That's the American statement, so we don't need any rhetorics anymore. Now we need the coalition agreement, which will have to show that we are actually delivering. And uh, one brief contribution here, just looking at it from the outside, uh, we had uh, three focuses in the election campaign, uh, industrial, sustainable, further development, then respect, and Europe. And uh, under the category of respect, you have minimum wages of 12 euros, 400,000 uh, uh, flats, uh, out of which 100,000 uh, social um, flats, and uh, respect, that's also interesting for Europe, that that's more than just uh, the material side of it, the, the, the tangible side of it. That was so interesting in this election campaign. So it's not just about an empty discourse, a uh, hollow discourse, but under this um, buzzword of respect, we have very clear political tasks, but it also has a kind of a soul and I think in Europe, you know, that is something we can also learn in Europe. Uh, a soul for Europe was a slogan. It's not always just about uh, material goods, but we have the human factor as well, and also the feeling of the people. That's also something which is being addressed. Well, normally I would be fully on your page, but in this particular case, I tend to quote Precht, First, you've got to have something on your plate. The people that we've seen which are relevant for the system and are those who receive the poorest income in this society need more than just a good feeling, but they also need a better remuneration. And of course, this is of great concern to me. I don't have any insider information available to me. I don't know how the negotiations go. But I'm really wondering, in view of what you're saying about the vast trajectory of needs that have to be tackled in order to bring climate, the climate under control, and the climate under control would be my utmost concern at the current moment. And I really don't know he can queer the circle. Thank you very much. So you do not only have a feeling of recognition, but you also want to have tangible and material improvements in life. Mrs. Korn, Mrs. Nyman spoke to you. So you really provided us with a lot of tasks and a whole plethora of different topics. Now, if we break it down to what are your expectations to the coalition? What would be the best possible results or the three big goals that you'd like to strive for? And we started a couple of minutes later, so let me wonder and ask you whether it's okay to keep on for another five or six minutes, because then I would like to ask you a question from the audience, if that's okay with you. And if you wish, please feel free and move on to the microphone. And now Mrs. Korn has had the chance to think about the three big topics that she would like to see realized. I'd like to make just one additional statement concerning the fact that in Germany, people in university with universities exams will not be evaluated or devalued. I think there are many people here who have a university degree. It's even worse in the U.S., but I think it's quite cynical to say that professions would not be devalued. If you look at the sanitation jobs, you know, there is hardly any little or social reward. And there are many jobs that exist of this particular type, so that we do have the problem in Germany as well. 
many things that I hope will be fulfilled as a consequence of the coalition agreement. My great concern is that with regards to climate change, the situation will even aggravate. I think we shift from the discussion that we have to deal with it in greater terms, but we have to fight against fossil fuel companies. With the newly created coalition, we will have to move away. We will move away from that. We will focus more on fossils and focus more on a market-based neoliberal society. When I look at the new coalition agreement features, the liberal said that the debt break should not be relieved. There should be no tax increases. And I'm wondering, how should that be financed? That's totally unclear. And this will lead to harsh social impediments. And then, of course, there will be very little social acceptance for climate protection. This is where redistribution is also important in order to raise acceptance. Let me just pass this first question on. Is this a dilemma? What do you mean by dilemma? When three parties won, then you've got to live with the fact that there needs to be a compromise. We just spoke about the primacy of policies. We spoke about Rawls and Sandil, and both are of diverging opinions. Then you look at Randall's perspective. Across the different generations, you can come up with a conception for justice, which might be superior to the political realm. But what we are doing is a group work action. That's what we're doing, is more Santel and Rest Rolls, if you try to compare it in that particular way. If I may add this additional point of criticism later on. And apart from that, we as social democrats try to get the best out of it, given the current situation that we're in. And we will come up with a good result. It will be very interesting to see what's going to happen. Now, let me pass the floor to you in the audience. Do you have one last final question to the panelists? If so, please take the floor right now. Now, there's a question from the chat. Mr. Nemes, well, please position yourself in front of the microphone. Mr. Nemes will quickly answer the question, would it be really be just if people got more access to more data but wouldn't really know what to do with it? Yes, first of all, access to data in Europe means that personal data will continue to be protected. So we need both. We need effective data protection of personal data and at the same time we need to aggregate the information for the public interest and to use it for economic interests. Those who want to use it for the public interest, such as civil societies, don't really know what to do with the data. That's absolutely correct. And that also needs to be something that we promote with European investments, and that happens at the European level as well as elsewhere. We make funds available in order to promote social society activities or religious groups or social groups and use data and experiments and get the necessary know-how in order to take care of measures if need be. Thank you very much. Now, Mrs. Rudolph has the very last question today. I hope I didn't take anybody else's possibility, but how about the neutrality thesis concerning the social good that was mentioned several times in the course of the discussion? I don't really want to call it good, but I wonder whether this neutrality really exists. I think with every policy decision that we take, we always realize a particular idea of social good, be it scholarly um, grants, then this is the best idea in order to promote education. Or when you talk about rental good, and if you support that, you've got the chance to realize a certain idea of decent life, good life, life where people raise their children instead of focusing on redistribution, especially in the election campaign. It might make a difference if you talk about a minimum wage of 15 euros and whether you think this is good or whether you tie this into the understanding of respect. 
I think we've done this sometimes too I implicitly and not explicitly. So therefore, I think, Mrs. Hassanaiman, my question too is, do you really believe that this new giraffe neutrality does exist? This is the question of Rose, where Michael Sandel was originally misunderstood in many cases. We have the ideal level of Rose, which is the veil of the unknown. And this is what Kant called a regulatory idea. Rose never thought that it would really be possible to come up with an idea of neutrality vis-à-vis -vis the good or to think of a person without a class or a race. But this was the nominal perspective, as he called it, the nominal perspective that we should expect when certain conditions when we talk about justice. Your question, of course, is absolutely right. In real life, we could never, ever abstract our term of the good. But what really, really convinced me today, I really like Michael Sanders, but I was never really convinced of him. But today I changed my mind. What really made me think was that, first of all, he spoke about the idea that trying to be neutral in our world leads to a situation where we only take on a market-driven conception of the good. That was really, really convincing. And then the second question that was always behind Rawls was, well, I know all the questions that I would have loved to ask him, but I can't remember them all. It's really a pity, you know. Only now do they occur to me, now that Sandal is gone. But what encourages people to accept the perspective of trying to bring about justice? I know Mr. Lauterbach believes that we were all born to believe in justice. That would be great. I know Franz Duval's work. We cooperated together with each other in the Einstein Forum. I also know Kim Kinder, psychology, children's psychology. I have three kids on my own. So therefore, I was able to see how they learn to be just at an early age. But I'm not 100% convinced, not as much as you are. I think I'm a bit more of a follower of Rousseau. I think we know how to feel compassionate with others, but not really just. We are rather more neutral, I dare say. So the question is, in practical political terms, he's a bit nervous, and I fully understand. No, that's perfectly OK. I simply wanted to relate to this particular point. I think in the past, there was a lot of speculation involved in this, but now the roles inspired this new thinking. But there was also a lot of speculation involved. And I think we were lucky. We were fortunate, because he had the right ethnic. He moved into the right direction. You know, we're moving into that direction, because the primates are not altruistic but they have a feeling for justice. I think it's really highly plausible that we have developed along these lines. I think the feeling of justice has just existed, and maybe this also involves a bit of altruism. I would love to believe it, and I think it's part of us. But, and that is my problem, I believe that society could ask for that or prevent this from being developed. And right now, I think we are all trained and educated to develop these. Oh, 
Yes, I agree to that. One more point. The extremely interesting point is the following. Duty of values which respect each other, but you will rather end up in neoliberalism. And that is something I'm not convinced of. And I hope that he will be wrong in this regard, but that's the decisive question. On to the question of the participant. People who are still followers of the conventional roles position, as I do, are not obliged to say that in society by and large, policymakers should not focus on basic values. So that's not the point, but distributive justice and the justice of opportunities, the conventional justice-based systems, values are more than justice in society, and therefore anything else is something that I hope that we can all agree on in order to build up a good society, a society that's just is not necessarily a good society, but a society which is not just cannot be a good society. I'm awfully sorry, but I have to bring this exciting debate to an ending. At the very beginning, the big question was, what is justice? We are already a little late, and this is why we have to bring this session to a closing single sentence only. What should we focus on most? What is it that we should discuss during one of the next sessions against the backdrop of the discussion today? Two seconds. Think about it. And now, let's start off with Mrs. Korn, because I think she knows exactly what she wants from us. Would be too simple if I simply said that People have to think about climate justice and redistribution much more, but I still do so. I hope that this will be discussed further on, especially in the British Iban tradition, which is close to the SPD, where these are not core issues, but should become issues. Mr. Niemann, in line with the question on data, I think it is very important for us to ask the question of how justice in a technological world, in the digital system, and in the algorithms when we're dealing with access to data can be ensured, also against the backdrop of the tremendous power concentration in this area, and the backdrop of the fact that private data make it possible to manipulate people. These are important questions concerning justice. Thanks very much. Mr. Lauterbach. Due to the tremendous urgency, I think roles should become a herald for climate change is speculative because he didn't express himself on that topic on that particular topic as far as I know. But nevertheless, I think it would really be a major enrichment to listen to his voice because his voice could be extrapolated. Thank you very much, Mrs. Nyman. I believe, too, and I slowly but surely come to the conclusion that the climate crisis needs to come first. But my suggestion would be associated with that. To which extent can social democrats, without being aware of it, free themselves from being caught up in neoliberal considerations. I think these neoliberal assumptions will be strengthened by evolutionary psychological considerations that are to be blamed for a lot. But I think the problem is that we think without reflecting upon it in neoliberal terms even though we try not to. For the new tasks you put onto our list of homeworks, thanks very much. For the intriguing and exciting debate that dealt with the question of justice at all levels, I think we have been very ambitious for the last two hours, two hours and 20 minutes. 
but I do hope that you were provided with a lot of food for thought, a lot of new interesting ideas, and you can be assured we will stay tuned. We will continue to talk about the topic of justice within FES and what's left. Thanks to all the participants, especially up here on the panel. Thanks to Professor Michael Sandel and to all those who have contributed to the success of this event. Have a pleasant evening. Thank you very much and bye-bye.